Hello, my name is Dr. Mitchell Culver, and I'm the manager of the Center for Student Analytics at Utah State University. I'm also an assistant professor in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership. And today I'm here to share with you a webinar called Rigor and Relief in Remote Learning Environments. And this webinar is a part of a series that is in response to the COVID-19 social distancing protocols that the nation is following. And so this remote teaching and learning analytics web series is geared towards helping faculty across the nation and particularly at Utah State University getting the most out of their remote teaching environments. Now, this is co-sponsored by the Office of Empowering Teaching Excellence and I'm really thankful for Dr. Travis Thurston for and, and Dr. John Louvier for their support in making this web, web series possible. Now uh, a special thank you goes out to the faculty at USU. Uh, USU faculty are working harder than ever to make the transition to temporary remote based teaching and learning successful. I've heard a number of stories I want to highlight here at the start of the video. One faculty member uh, I was speaking with had spent 14 uh, hours on email last week on one day, 14 hours in one day answering student emails. And I thought that was pretty compelling. Another example I heard that I wanted to highlight was when the, um, the move to remote teaching first happened in our journalism and communications department, one of the faculty realized that his students would need filming equipment um, in order to make their coursework work. And so he loaded his car up with all this filming equipment and then drove around our city delivering the filming equipment to his students. And the students, um, extraordinarily thankful. I heard that directly from a student, how, how impressed they were with that kind of faculty response. And then another example I could share is um, I was talking with a faculty member and he shared that he had been recording his uh, lectures for online delivery and uh, had just uh, stayed up and recorded one at midnight because it needed to be done and wasn't uh, wasn't opposed to that, got, got to um, do that midnight recording. And so we know our faculty are working harder than ever and we really appreciate that. Um, this webinar was made possible in part by a series of student interviews I conducted. I conducted seven and a half hours of focus groups with students last week, um, asking them how they've experienced the move to remote learning and also their impressions about the future. And this webinar is grounded in a great deal of their feedback and also in some learning science. So one of the quotes that really stood out for me uh, from the seven and a half hours was one student said, my motivation to stay on top of my classes has plummeted. It's hard to find motivation in the current circumstances. And obviously you can feel for the student. We, we know the kind of situation that remote-based teaching and learning has produced an unexpected move based on the COVID-19 crisis. And so you can understand this, this sentiment. And it got me thinking about how university works. How does a university work and how can we make that continue to work um, even though uh, and uh, even though we're in this, this challenging situation, but also to help our students be successful and feel motivated to get the get the gains that they expect from the university. So how does university work? Well, if you'll look at life, um, there is this kind of interesting relationship between the things we want, which we call desire, and the things that are available to us that we would find rewarding. Only where those things overlap, where the things we want overlap the things that we want. Uh, that are available, excuse me, uh, are there opportunities for success and happiness? And so we all kind of come into life with a certain overlap here. And then as we grow, the overlap kind of gets larger. But the goal of higher education is to increase the available rewards that someone has access to. If you can increase the circle of available rewards, watch what happens to that real estate that's labeled opportunities for success and happiness. It just dramatically expands. It expands in all directions, but uh, at least some of that expansion is going to overlap with the things in life that we want. And this is important. Now, there's a lot of different ways to expand to this circle of available rewards. Funding, right? You can win the lottery or uh, different things we could talk through. The one I want to focus on, actually, is just competence. Anytime you increase a person's competence, you're in increasing their ability to get rewards um, more available in their life. And therefore, you're probably going to increase at least some of the time rewards that overlap with the things that people want. And therefore, competence enhances our opportunities for success and happiness. And anyone involved in education understands that that's why we're engaged in the educational enterprise, higher education, K-12, it doesn't matter. We want to increase competence so people have more opportunities for success and happiness, this overlap. Now, how do you uh, get Competence. How does competence emerge in life? Well, we we there's a lot of different ways it can emerge. We do know from the learning sciences that adversity and mild failures really help us produce gains in competence. This idea of a crucible being the crucible of affliction uh, helps you to grow and develop your skill sets. It's how we, you know, when you go into the uh, gym 
a fitness center and you work out, it's that adversity you're putting your muscles through and lifting the weights that causes you to get those gains. Well, here's kind of two pictorial representations of that adversity. Miles Gravios, I want to talk to you about this adversity. Uh, student um, comes from the Latin studium, which is painstaking application of oneself to some endeavor. Uh, to be a student is to be in pain. And that seems kind of funny, but the goal of higher education is put students through some kind of rigor or challenge that they wouldn't otherwise experience. Uh, and so you can call higher education kind of structured adversity. We bring students into the university to challenge them in ways that they wouldn't naturally experience. You know, if they're just wandering around in the forest or, you know, living their normal life, they wouldn't be challenged. We build challenge in the syllabus. We structure some adversity and we say, if you'll go through these, uh, if you'll go through these hurdles, jump through these, over these hurdles, then it'll help you to grow and become the kind of person you want to be increase your competence and increase your opportunities for success and happiness. Now, a critical aspect of the university is we don't structure adversity in a vacuum. We build in social support from faculty members, from friends, classmates, from uh, the student services and programs that are available to students. We structure adversity, we also provide social support. And so if you build the university kind of as a model in your mind, you have students doing the activities that students do, you know, homework and these kinds of things going to class all geared towards achieving the outcomes that they want. And you have two columns of the institution, two main columns, there's a lot of columns, but there's two main ones. The first is the faculty who administer the curriculum that challenges the students in this kind of rigor that we talked about to help them grow. And you also have professional staff on the other column who offer services and programs to help students kind of get the most out of their experience. But you also have the executive leadership who empower the faculty and professional staff to do what they do. Well, these two wings of the institution are what we call rigor and relief, or what I call rigor and relief, right? So on the one side, you have the lightning volcano, uh, this kind of being kicked in the teeth by what's in the syllabus, uh, helping you to grow in that crucible, helping you to be better version of yourself and gain that confidence. And on the other side, because that tends to produce a little upset stomach, you have this Pepto-Bismol of the services and the programs. Um, dances, tutoring, uh, going in and participating in a club or an organization, game night, intramural sports, you know, athletic events, all these different things that we offer to students to help them have a little relief from the rigor of the classroom so that they can get back to um, getting the best gains from, from their from their academic experience. Now, if it was only one-sided, if we only introduced rigor into the students' lives, it wouldn't work. It would be too overwhelming. We know that a combination of rigor and relief or supports kind of getting your academic nutrition, social nutrition, uh, is what makes university possible. Well, with the move to online teaching, you can tell that this is actually the equations being a little tinkered here with, because while classes were able to move online pretty seamlessly, all those Pepto-Bismol kind of programs and services were not. And so the concern that I'm hearing in these student interviews that I conducted is, is that this equation is a little bit unbalanced. And I wanna to talk to you about that. Now, there is a special circumstance where one person can provide both the rigor and the relief. Here's a picture of Rocky Balboa and his training coach, who I don't know his name, it's a beautiful movie, but this training coach I think is well known in kind of the cultural mythology that this training coach was a person who both challenged Rocky and also provided him the relief, right? It was this kind of what we think of as tough love. You can get a person who, you know, you don't have to separate it into two columns. If, if, if a person kind of were to take this role on, they could say, I'm, I'm going to challenge my students, but I'm also going to be a little bit of Pepto-Bismol for them also, so they don't get too much upset stomach, so they actually can get the relief that they need in order to see those gains. So this was captured best in a student comment from these focus groups that I ran. And the student said, the courses don't need to be made easier. We're paying for it to be hard. And this was an acknowledgement in the move to online, uh, the student was saying, as we move online, I've had some faculty just cancel assignments and just wipe things out. And now we're only ever gonna take the final. And the student, she said, I don't know that that's the best thing. I mean, we, we, we're here to grow and eliminating course requirements is maybe not the best approach. Maybe just shifting them or altering them or being flexible in them would be a better approach. And so I think what she was kind of thinking about is, is keep it challenging, but also keep it manageable. And this is a theme that came up throughout all of my interviews is, is that the students would say, 
you know, I understand the need for challenge, but it also needs to be manageable. So this webinar is going to kind of speak to instructors who are engaged in remote based teaching, uh, whether those remote based teaching environments are temporary because of COVID-19 or more permanent on an ongoing basis, because that's just the nature of things. Um, this webinar is designed to help you to capture this kind of idea of challenging remote based teaching environments but manageable for the students, where you can be both the rigor and the relief that students need to be successful. Now, in terms of rigor, note that there's two types and one's good and one's bad. Intentional rigor is kind of this crafted blueprint of how you think that the student needs to be challenged in order to grow, right? Intentional rigor is well-designed, it's thought out ahead of time, it's very in, in, intentional. Intentional. Unintentional rigor is kind of this messiness that happens if a faculty member is disorganized, if they're not shooting straight on the mark, if they, you know, in terms of getting everything, all their ducks in a row and making sure that everything goes on nicely. A lot of faculty um, have reacted to this COVID-19 situation proactively with this kind of designing of intentionality and others have acted more reactively and some of the some of the challenges students are facing are a result of unintentional rigor right this kind of COVID-19 is spread around and it's making things unintentionally difficult and this is what we want to avoid we have to be reflective and think are the challenges my students are currently facing are they intentionally designed by me to enhance students competence so that they can get more out of life or are they unintentional and i'm just kind of saying well students are just going to have to deal with it we're in a tough situation well there there can be a little bit of both because we're all in a little bit of a situation aren't we the move to online teaching is challenging even for the best of us and so uh, we just want to mitigate unintentional rigor yeah, it may not be possible to eliminate it entirely. So I'm just trying to be a little flexible with faculty to let you know that it's not all on your shoulders, but to whatever extent you can do small things to mitigate unintentional rigor, we want you to do that. A student said, you know, one of the reasons why this unintentional rigor is so challenging is because um, online, generally, remote-based learning feels like a heavier load because you're alone. And it really is a lot more work. Uh, when everything's been moved online, uh, it's, it's not the same as showing up to class sitting with your classmates, raising your hand and asking a question. And so this, this, this online learning actually turns into a lot of kind of sitting on the couch doing kind of menial things. And so anything a faculty member can do to eliminate any kind of unintentional challenges, but keep everything in the challenging intentional, intentional domain, uh, that would be better. So how do we do that? So how can we provide manageable rigor for students in remote-based environments? So one of the students said it, it was really useful for the faculty to set expectations. So they said ex expectation setting by the faculty is important. It's also reassuring. We know this from the idea evaluation. So we, uh, Utah State, uh, uh, partner with a company called IDEA for our faculty end of semester evaluations. And in one of their papers, they have this quote, research conducted in nearly 500,000 classes across more than 300 institutions revealed that instructors are more likely to earn high student ratings of instruction when their students say their teacher challenged them and had high achievement standards. And this is getting back to what that student said, we're paying for it to be hard, we're paying for it to be challenging. Is this that students want to be challenged and they don't want, you know, unnecessary violence in the syllabus where they're just being absolutely racked with the assignments and the readings and everything. But they do want high expectations. They do want uh, to be challenged. And they also want this Pepto-Bismol. They want you to help them to meet those achievement standards. So set high standards and it also scaffold the students into um, reaching those goals. And so partly it's just about transparency, isn't it? It's about setting expectations, saying, here's what I expect. Here's why I'm expect providing the rationale why you expect those things. And then helping students to know some of the hints and tips and tricks that they can use to get better at whatever the assignment is. All right. Now, another thing uh, that uh, students have expressed, a theme that continually emerged is this idea of not knowing whether or not their instructor is going to be flexible with them. So this student says, a professor just moved everything online without changing the expectations or deadlines. The online format was more challenging than I thought it would be. When I thought I might not turn an assignment in on time, I felt pushed up against the deadline. And partly what she was expressing was this idea that she didn't know how her faculty member was going to react if she reached out and said, can I have an extension? Or, you know, this week's been rough. Uh, you know, my online stuff is all stacked up. And so in remote-based learning environments, our recommendation to you as faculty is making students aware that you will be flexible before they need that flexibility is crucial. Partly we know from some research, Roy Baumeister down in Florida 
uh, has done a lot of great research on uncertainty. We know that uncertainty causes a reduction in blood glucose levels. You can actually introduce per a person into an uncertain environment and just clock the drop in their blood glucose. As uncertainty increases, our blood glucose decreases. It makes us feel tired, grumpy, fatigued, hangry, right? Like an angry bear. Uh, which in turn, these drops in blood glucose levels causes impairment in being able to deal with uncertainty. So it's not just that it taps our, un, uh, our blood glucose as a resource, but as that drops, then we're impaired with even dealing with that uncertainty, right? Since blood glucose is a limited resource, it can be replenished, but in periods of time, it's limited, right? For you know, four hours before you start to have these drops, any influx of uncertainty stacks up against the dwindling supply. And so... When you think about, I don't know if you've been experiencing this, but as I'm in self-isolation here at my home, working from home for the last three weeks or whatever it's been, I have felt this dwindling kind of supply of my motivational resources, right? That this influx of uncertainty from COVID-19 and everything that's going on and all the news you read, it stacks up. And uh, when that supply dwindles, you know, I've taken, you know, normally I take a lunch at noon and, and have, you know, sit down and eat lunch, I'm taking a nap on lunch anymore. I, I go, oh, I'm going to eat a sandwich. I'm going to go lay down and have a little lie down for 25 minutes because these are hard days. And so I think the students are feeling the exact same thing. You're probably feeling the same thing yourself, that, that there's these new sources of uncertainty throughout our lives of COVID-19 and what about this and what about that? And are we going to get the vaccination and all, all the unknowns? Those are coming up against us. They're all the remote teaching and learning stuff that we've had to do in this transition. All that, that students have lost in terms of having to move home, having less access to programs and services, less access to social. And so you can see that, that this is just stacking up and it's just overwhelming. And we don't need to reduce the rigor, but we can help manage that rigor in the way that we conduct our classes. So how do we do that? How do we how do we help students uh, deal with this uncertainty that's stacking up on them? Well, avoid unnecessary burdens. Uh, so in one study, uh, focus group, a student said, my instructor has started recording three two and a half hour lectures in place of our three 50 minute in-class lectures. So the instructor's using the move to online to just kind of ramble on and on and on and not set a time limit and, and realize, this is another student said, when we shifted to online, the amount of time my instructor started expecting to devote to my class was unreasonable given that that's not my only class. The, the faculty were adding burdens uh, because not, not accounting for the move to remote and not thinking, well, if this was, you know, my class times five, would that even be manageable? And so, we want you to avoid unnecessary burdens. We want you to kind of take an inventory of your online course environment. Is my expectations reasonable given everything that students are probably having to do in their other classes as well? And so if you're thinking about like the Carnegie Carnegie equation of, you know, this kind of for every hour you're in class, you're spending two hours outside of a class. Are you staying true to that equation or have you, or have you run, run aground? Okay. Another thing you can do is recommend specific strategies to your students. So one strategy that a student came up with in one of these focus groups, he said, I watch my lectures on one and a half times speed because I can still understand perfectly well what the instructor is saying. And if I miss something, I can go back, but it helps me to get through my lecture so much more quicker. And, and we know this from, from research that, that you can listen actually four times faster than most people can speak. Our ability to take in information is quite good. So uh, one and a half times speed is not too fast. You could even watch this on one and a half times speed, I bet. But students can figure these things out. Um, and if you recommend this, you know, figure out how to watch my lecture on one and a half times speed. One even 1.25, right? One and a quarter speed. That can be a big recommendation for students. Uh, have students email you in questions after each recorded lecture. You know, have them have an assignment. Say, hey, you know, I want you to watch these video lectures. I know that's pretty taxing and boring, but I want you to send me one or three questions after each recorded lecture. And then what I'll do as a faculty member is I'll read through all the questions. I won't get to every single one. I'm not going to respond to every question. That's not the point. But if I see a theme, right, coming up where, you know, 13 students all ask the exact same question or need the same point of clarification, then I'll get back to you in my next lecture. And I'll answer those questions that are kind of have aggregated together and, and obviously need to be answered. And maybe you can do more just depending on what your threshold is. You need to be reasonable with yourself also. Uh, never take any of my suggestions as to say you should just throw yourself on your sword for these students and, and just completely be unreasonable. 
in your time, take these recommendations to the extent that you can incorporate them. One thing you might also recommend, and I didn't put it in the slide, but a number three here that I'm just thinking is remind your students to eat snacks during, during their day and, and maybe model that. Have a snack while you're giving your lecture and say, hey, you know, our blood glucose is a limited supply. Uh, as we deal with uncertainty, it diminishes, we get hangry, we get fatigued. Stock yourself up, you know, make a special order from Sam's Club or from Costco of little, you know, uh, high protein, kind of high carb treats, you know, cashews or little granola bars or whatever it is that, that you recommend to your students because they wouldn't know otherwise unless someone tells them, if you're not feeding your body, of course you're going to get angry and fatigued. And the same goes for each one of us. Now, another thing you can do, a really great uh, insight from one focus group. A student said, you know, the problem is in these lectures is maybe they'll record 50 minutes. And in 50 minutes, there's different chunks of material, but I have to one, watch the whole 50 minutes all at once, or at least pause, and it's not easy to come back to. He said, I wish my instructor would chunk, like, you know, if he's going to give special assignment instructors, just make that one video to, a, to the side. It's he's going to make schedule changes, call it the schedule change video, make it three minutes. If he's going to give group feedback on a test that we took, you know, do that in its own video. And then if he's going to lecture, maybe lecture in sections, do 20 minutes here and 20 minutes there. And then I can allow my schedule to build around what I have time to watch. And so if, instead of having one 50 minute chunk, if I have all these various time lengths of chunks of different topics that are nicely titled, then I can do that. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, that's an awful lot of work. Like I, I don't even know how to do one video, let alone four or five. But you can call, you reach out to the city support and you can reach out to them and say, hey, uh, you know, the instructional design team, and you can say, hey, I need help figuring out how to do this or whatever it is. But uh, it, uploading the videos, it may be a challenge, but if you can get the hang of that and chunk your material, it might be wise. Another suggestion, uh, by the way, in that focus group with this student, when he said that, all the other students chimed in and said, oh, me too, me too. Could, I wish, oh, absolutely, that would be so helpful. Because they said, I sit on my couch for five hours and like I feel locked in, but like I don't feel the flexibility that I need. So getting used to this remote-based teaching, that would be a good suggestion. Another suggestion, create a social study hour where students can sit in a web room and complete assignments in each other's presence, right? And so uh, this kind of, uh, know that students aren't going to, um, I guess this came from a student comment. She, she basically said, when I would go to class, I would be sitting with my friends. If I was, you know, sitting, waiting to go in the room, I could chat with someone. On my way out, I could chat with someone, then we could go get an orange juice together. She said it was very organic. And now I can chat with my friends over text, where it's not organic and I'm not meeting new people. And so we kind of talked through, well, what would you like? And they said, it'd be cool if the, if the professor set a time in the evening, a couple hours. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, something where they said, you know, I'm going to open my web room available to you all from six to eight. I'll turn it on and I won't be there listening or whatever, but you, you guys go ahead and log in. And if there's, if you just want to kind of hang out and have some, someone to study with, and maybe even ask your students what time they want, maybe they want it from four to six, or they want it from two to four or whatever. I don't know what, but kind of interact with students and ask them, you know, is there a way that you could turn on a study hour where they could kind of be in the same group and it's unstructured contact where they do have a chance to say, hey, how are you doing? And talk about decompose and decompress. And that, that, I thought that was a good idea. The students thought so too. Okay, uh, this is, I think, the last slide. Uh, uh, incorporate authentic opportunities to interact. So, for example, briefly introducing your dogs or cats, etc., can be a, a big help in the middle of the lecture to help students have that variety. One student said, I, she said, I just need a little variety in these lectures. I don't know what it's going to take, but sometimes they just go and go and go, and I wish I had a little variety. You know, in a classroom, students are asking questions. It gives you a little break, a natural tangent, okay? And, and so anything you can do to kind of do what we would call or consider maybe a commercial break or an intermission in your video that, like I say, it's brief. They don't want a 20-minute introduction to your dog. But if you were to have a five-minute intermission and, like, you know, kind of do something silly, a little vaudeville or whatever, I think your students would really appreciate that. And don't get overboard. They don't want, you know, five minutes of you doing intermission. They want 45 seconds. Um, the other thing is incorporate informal elements into your lecture. Um, this was a student who said in class, before their move to remote teaching, her instructor had had an ongoing joke about outrageous, Reese's outrageous bar and, and would always bring one to class and eat it in class and kind of like have this moment with his Reese's outrageous bar. Fine. Well, 
when the Rav Tarot teaching this instructor, I thought was very clever. He he hides a rhesus outrageous bar somewhere on the slide for the students to find some, somewhere in the video. He doesn't talk about it, he doesn't mention it. It just shows up. And it's kind of this inside joke between him and his students. Now, I'm not suggesting start putting random candy bars in your lecture. I think you have to come up with what your authentic thing is. But uh, these informal elements that remind students that we're all just human, we're all in this together, really go a long way. Now, to leave you with two final thoughts. One student said, uh, at the end of the focus group, she said, after all we've talked through, you know, and there's, there's ways that faculty can be doing better with this, this is doable. It's doable for all of us. It was very confident. And, and I think that that was a theme that came up throughout all of the focus groups was that students were saying, you know, we can do this together. We can pull together. We can get better at this. We can grow in this. Another student said, you know, a part of the evidence of that is, is everyone's out of their comfort zone. We're all having some trouble right now. And to that extent, it's okay. It's okay that we're having challenges and we can all kind of take it one day at a time here. But this idea is, is, is that we can get this done and we need to give ourselves a little freedom to relax and make sure that we're providing high quality remote teaching environments. And so that's my final thought to you, uh, that this is doable. And I do see that, that the faculty are pulling together, pulling themselves up. The students are pulling together, pulling themselves up. And together, I think we can get this done. I really appreciate you watching this webinar. We'll have uh, additional webinars. Some of the webinars that are coming in the series are gonna be a lot more technical than this has been. This has just been kind of a focus group based uh, insights. But if you have questions, you can certainly reach out by email and we're happy to interface with you. Watch for the next webinar in a couple of days and then uh, about two a week will be coming out over the next several weeks. So we really appreciate your time. Keep up the good work and uh, have a good afternoon. We'll see you.